It's always a little bit iffy though. So I'm just going to check. We like to check to make sure people can hear us and That's right. we're not saying all this good stuff and it's being wasted. <laughs> yep. Quick check. Of course, people can watch the replay, which is always nice as well. <laughs> okay. If you are seeing this live, leave us a comment. Um, tell us where you're from. Where are you watching this from? We are here with, it's an honor to be here with Dathan Rissenheim, elite runner, Olympian, and we're going to jump into all kinds of questions. And okay, I think I see us there. There's a little bit of a delay, but um, Dathan, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm, I'm here in Michigan right now and just, you know, it's lots of time at home, but uh, I can I can run really easily from my house and stuff. So, you know, it's been... Uh, the the professional runner lifestyle is a little bit easier of a transition from than a lot of people in this uh, this time right now. So. For sure, you're used to you know kind of working independently, somewhat um, working from home. Probably, do you still have access to a track? Or are you doing mostly road workouts right now, or how does that look? Well, I'm I'm, I'm old now, so I don't go on the track anymore. I, I only go to the track when my athletes I coach are working out. So my my track days are done. I just I can't do the speed work anymore that I used to. So, um, but as I moved to, you know, to longer distances, that was okay. So, um, so I got dirt roads like within a half a mile from my house and there is the public track still open. Um, it's just, you know, it's, you know, like for my runners, they go, it's kind of, you know, like it's just, they're not going in a group and stuff, but, um, but you know, we've been able to go out and do that stuff. I think the biggest thing is, uh, haven't maybe had like the, the massage and the uh, PT and stuff as much as normal. And I got a really good home gym, but I don't do my, you know, my big stuff at the gym anymore. So the running part is easy. It's just the, the coaching part and the, uh, the other parts, the lifting and, and all the other little things that's got a little, a little bit harder. Plus I my do. kids are here all the time and that's really hard. <laughs> what ages are your kids? My uh, daughter is 11, no 12, sorry. My daughter's 12 and my son's nine. So, oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, definitely busy ages. I'm sure it's been interesting um, schooling them from home as well. <laughs> That's my wife's job now. So she, she's a, she, her, her job got on, uh, got furloughed. So I was actually really happy about that because if it was me and them at home, it would be, uh, it would be bad. I tried the first day and, you know, like uh, math, like apparently I only had a sixth grade math uh, education because I was struggling with her math. <laughs> I hear you. <ya. laughs> It's hard now, that common core math. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't learn it that way. <laughs> no. no. We're old school too, so. <laughs> well, we got all kinds of folks saying hi. Hello from Ontario, Florida. Matt, uh, where Matt, else? Matt says he's been following you since your high school days. So, yeah. all right. Long time fan. Cool. Texas. Very cool. Awesome. Okay, so if you are just jumping in here, we are with the man, the legend, Dathan Ritzenheim, Olympic runner. And uh, we are going to just jump into, you know, his career and any questions that you guys have for Dathan. He's also a coach and just a wealth of knowledge. In fact, right before I got on this call, Dathan, one of our coaches on our team said, uh, I can't believe you're talking to Dathan Ritzenheim. I, I use his uh, form drills and his dynamic stretch cool. drills all the time. <laughs> That's awesome. That's good to hear. I mean, it's cool to see people, you know, use the net and showing, you know, coaches that are, you know, working with other people, you know, and, you know, I always like that when we have like these, uh, when we have these things, these events and stuff like that and having people come in and then they have people, you know, that they, it's kind of, it's, it's like a almost pyramid scheme is not the right thing because it's not a scheme, but it's a pyramid, you know, like where you, you know, it's going out and it reaches out and, the tentacles start touching other things and it's, it's pretty cool. So I've had a lot of people that have supported me and a lot of knowledge that I've gained from, from people over the years. So it's cool to see, you know, you know, other people use that as well. For sure. Um, so let's, let's start with this for a lot. Of, I think we have a lot of new runners in the group, um, which is awesome folks that are building up to the first 5k, for example, and maybe they just start running even this year, like in January. Um, so for those that don't know you, can you give us a quick just bio and how yeah. you, uh, got to be a professional runner? Yeah. So I'm, uh, so I'm a 37 now, but, uh, I've been running a long time. I've uh, been a professional for 16 years now and kind of at the tail end here, but, uh, but I, I started out at, 
you know, I wasn't a great, like the, the first couple of years, uh, I started when I was about 11 or 12 years old. My dad got into, uh, running and triathlon as a total like lifestyle change. Uh, he, you know, smoker, drinker, all that stuff and went on the whole uh, health kick and I kind of just tagged along and started doing five K's and things like that. And, um, but you know, once I started really training hard, you know, things started clicking and there's a lot of talent there. And so, um, I won a couple of high school national championships, um, and, uh, went on to the university of Colorado. I won the, the, the NCAA championships there in cross country. And, um, and then I've been, I started out as a track runner, you know, mostly, uh, 3k, 5k, 10k. And, uh, and then I started in the marathon pretty quickly, but, um, three Olympic, three Olympic teams, three world championship teams and, uh, former American record holder in the 5k. And I could talk about myself all day, but you know, like <laughs> now, the, now I, <laughs> the Olympic teams. So, uh, Beijing, what are the other two? So the first one was in Athens in 2004. I ran the 10K, and then I ran the marathon in Beijing, and then yeah. uh, in 08, and then in 2012 the 10K again. And so I awesome. I kind of bounced back and forth between the track and the and the roads for a long time, and then 2013 World Championships was my last year on the track, and uh, since then I've I've only done road races and um, mostly half marathons and marathons now, and uh, and so it's uh it's been fun though it's been at 37 i've had a really long career and so I'm, yeah. i've been blessed with that do you have an olympic tattoo the rings i do on my calf but <laughs> okay. the but and i got that one after the first one um it was in boulder at uh there was a tattoo parlor called scarred for life oh no and uh <laughs> the guy had tattoos all over his face and so i was like that's the guy that i want that's to do he's so He's so, he knows he's got so much confidence that he's got these all over. And, but I, I told him I wanted the Olympic rings and he didn't know what they were. <laughs> so, said, I thought I was going to say, which, which side of your neck do you want? <laughs> yeah. On? Big one right down here, you know, but unfortunately the yellow has worn away now over the years of being in the sun. And so now it, everybody tells me, you know, like, how come there's only four? And I used to say, you know, well, that's when I, I have unfinished business, but now I, I don't think there's too any more Olympics in me. So now I'm just going to have to go bite the bullet and head back to scar for life and get them filled in, I think. <laughs> or maybe it means you're coaching a future Olympian, you know. There you go. All well, right. That's when I'm switching to that now. So the next Olympian that I coach is, you know, that's when I fill it in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, a minute ago, I just mentioned um, dynamic stretching and form drills. And, uh, can we circle back to that and kind of tell me, yeah. tell, tell everyone, uh, maybe some recommended dynamic stretches before running and form drills. So, uh, I was fortunate, you know, like when going back to what we were talking about learning from a lot of the best, um, when I was just coming out of this professional runner, you know, in college, I didn't, we didn't really do anything, but, uh, I started to, I had, I've been taught by Dan Pfaff, who is one of the best sprint coaches ever. I mean, uh, he's, uh, he's a legend and been around forever. And, uh, he, I learned all these, you know, drills, um, you know, most, a lot of runners, you know, sprinters might know them, uh, a skips, B skips dribbling. It's a lot of stuff, you know, to create uh, lower leg stiffness and rhythm and things like that. And just general range of motion. And so, you know, like I do that, I've done them now since 2004, like for, you know, 16 years, and it's part of my uh, four to five times a week I do them. And it's something that on my workout days, I do my easy jogging to, to warm up. For me, it's three miles. A lot of people, it might be 10 minutes, something like that, you know. But it's three miles of easy jogging. And then I start with dynamic flexibility, which is just uh, they're, not, they're not static stretches where you're holding. There's a movement pattern, a hold, and you stretch for a certain period of time. And so you try to elongate the muscles slowly and then the next step is to do the the sprint drills or the form drills which are a bit more ballistic and you get greater range of motion and greater force output but it's like the next step and then i do strides which are faster than harder than that so i build up to the point when i start my intervals i've gradually gotten progressively you know progressively faster progressive range of motion stuff like that and then i also do them two days a week as just a, I don't want to say maintenance, but it's part of my, um, to nowadays strides is speed work to me. So like I do those before strides as well. Oh, I lost you. 
I lost you somewhere. I lost you. I don't know. If you hear me? I can't hear you anymore. Hmm. Let me go to the little uh, settings guy. No, I hear I hear it on there. Hmm. Can you hear me still? I can't hear you. Shoot. Can you hear us now? Yep, now I hear you. Okay, good. Yep, <laughs> sorry. I don't know what I did. I didn't do anything, no, I swear. It wasn't you, man. This, <laughs> this thing is so buggy. It is. <laughs> It's We're, happened to us before too, so. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> that I didn't touch it. No. <laughs> the wonders of Facebook Live. <laughs> okay, so we uh, we were talking about dynamic stretching a second ago. Angie, I think you had a follow up question, but we do have a lot of questions coming in, so we should probably. Yeah, I was just going to say that you know, for a lot of our newer runners in the group, that it's really important to point out, like you said, you progressively warm up your muscles before you start doing any intense or faster work, because mm -hmm. you know it's kind of a recipe for injury if you just get out there and you start running hard. Absolutely, and that's you know, like so the think of it like you know the slow process. It's like your car; like it takes five minutes for your car to get going, right before. Mm -hmm. You can notice the difference in performance and so your muscles your cardiovascular system it's the same thing and so doing those is great and also the opposite way like i do the dynamic i don't do the drills but i do the dynamic flex you know flexibility as on the other side when i'm cooling down before i do my static stretching and so it's it's a build up and a build and and a gradually coming back down and so but i would say that doing any of those drills you should know what you're doing and have instruction first because you can very easily do them wrong. So I do have some videos that I've done, you know, like that helps show those, but really it's very, anything that's, um, uh, anything that's new, knowing, making sure you know what you're doing is a good idea first. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a great point. There are some videos for those in are interested, um, dynamic stretching and form drills, uh, by Dathan Ritzenheim. Just go to YouTube. Am I, am I, am I right? I think so. so yeah, anybody that wants to go there right now and like grab a link to his videos on YouTube about form drills and post it in the chat so everyone else can see it. Yeah, that'd be cool. And we got some questions coming up here. I think another piece of the puzzle for a lot of runners is figuring out how to work their nutrition and their fueling. What kind of tips yeah. do you have for people related to, to fueling and really treating your body well so that you can recover well? Your body produces what, you know, like based on what you put into it for sure. It's not like an engine, but it's similar in that way. And so you, not all, not all energy is created the same. And so there's a lot of byproduct and a lot of, um, a lot of negative consequence too. So, you know, really high sugar, you know, things like that. It's maybe only great when you're doing really intense exercise, like other than that, you know, like when it's readily available, mm -hmm. other than that, there's a lot of negative, you know, things that happen, um, r rise in blood sugar levels and things like that, that, um, that have detriment to your overall health, but also daily training. And so, you know, like when I started working with UCAN in 2014, it was, you know, based on my generally offer my, my, my daily training, you know, and, and trying to have level, you know, blood sugar level, um, source of energy. And so my diet now, I try to do that just in general. I try to eat very healthy, well-rounded, but man, when I was younger, I, I had horrible nutrition and both, mostly cause I just didn't know, you know, like, I mean, I, I grew up in the nineties where snack wells and things like that is, it was the low fat, you know, everything was replaced with sugars and mm. things like that. And so my, my knowledge base coming out was nothing. And I started getting injured. Um, my college coach, 
basically wrote down a list of uh, vegetables, go, go to Whole Foods and eat and buy these. And I'm looking at it thinking, oh, well, I can't afford that. First of all, like, uh, you know, I'm a college student, but I <laughs> had never heard of some of these things. And so, um, you know, to me, in, like in college, a steak and cereal was like a well-rounded meal, you know? And so <laughs> now I try to, you know, try to go throughout the day and be a lot better, but also having those sources you know, when you're trained, like I train twice a day a lot. And, uh, mm. and so I try to make sure that I have adequate fuel. I, I go with usually every three hours, there's something in the body. Um, I try not to be ever really hungry. And I, then that way I don't stuff myself ridiculously either because I haven't, you know, been going six or seven hours without fuel either. And so, yeah. um, so, you know, you can, for me has been a part of that and just generally learning nutrition, you know, has been, it's been important too. And so, yeah, you can't, you can't run your best, stay healthy and perform day in and day out if you're not putting the right things in your body. Either. So you mentioned that you, you found you can, uh, in 2012 and that that's like right around the time they started, I think. Yeah. Really early. Believe it or not, I was on. I was almost one of the first people to use it before Meb even. Uh, one of the guinea pigs, almost. Yeah, <laughs> I, I almost was the Meb, but uh, you know that. So what happened is uh, Meb was working with the sports uh, physiologist nutritionist Krista Austin, who helped with the development of you know of uh, uh, UCAN. And so uh, what happened is I was started working with her as well during my marathon, uh, training buildup and for the London marathon. And what happened is I crashed and burned again. And she said, Meb's using this product. You should try it. And I said, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. You know? And, uh, I waited like three years, you know, Meb went on and won New York and all that stuff. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so finally I, I kicked the, uh, you know, I, I, I kicked back to it and, and found it again in 2014 when I was coming back trying to, get completely off the track at that point. I was doing the marathon. I really needed to figure out the fuel much more because the marathon fueling becomes um, you know, everything. And so yeah. trying to become better at burning fatty acids uh, for fuel because, you know, on the track, you know, you're burning up that muscle glycogen and stuff right away. But uh, the marathon, you want to become more efficient and because the stores run out, you know, at some point and you don't ever usually – unless you're completely uh, under, you know, un under fueled, you're not going to burn out of carbohydrates, you know, within your body to utilize in a over a 10 K, but in a marathon, you will no matter what. And so yeah. I started using it in 2014 to try to become better at that. Awesome. And, uh, let's, let's get to some questions from our amazing viewers here. We have folks from Poland, Miami, uh, all over the U S uh, watching and more people will watch up after the live stream ends, I'm sure. <clears throat> so here's one. My next marathon, if it happens, will be a steady downhill course. Other than making sure my long runs have downhill stretches, any particular training uh, would you recommend for that type of course? So, you know, with a, with a downhill course, like similar to Boston is a net downhill. There's a lot of uphills yeah. too, but, um, uh, you know, your, your quads become like the shock absorbers to the body and the eccentric load, which is when you're running downhill, the muscles, you know, they try to, they're contracting at the same time as they're elongating to, you know, to stop you. And, um, and so basically you have to condition them. Otherwise they're just going to blow out just like your car does when you're rattling down a dirt road that has a bunch of potholes. So by doing the downhill running, um, you're, you're conditioning them, but there's also a, a risk to that. There's a lot more force going in. And so what I found to be beneficial is having that, you know, having that ability to run fast on the downhills, but just generally doing a little bit more speed, I think is good because it, cr it creates a longer stride, you know, which is essentially the same thing that happens when you're going downhill. And so you have, you have the ability to, to condition your muscles sometimes without the, the force coming down that you would be going downhill. And so I found that to be beneficial. It also just sometime in the weight room has been very beneficial too, like doing eccentric exercises, slow, um, slow squats, you know, very slow coming down. You can count to five or, you know, like 
single leg things, stuff like that. And you can condition the quads for that eccentric load without, you know, without maybe the, the pounding of doing a hard run downhill. That's great advice. Right on. Here's a different question. <clears throat> what do you think is the most entertaining way to zone out during a long run? See, you don't want to zone out. You just want to embrace the suck the whole <laughs> That's way. Right. That's what Angie does. Well, I hate the headphone thing because people, I hate scaring people on the run, you know, when they're <laughs> plugged in and then you run by and they jump. Um, yeah. So zoning out is, um, is you want to be zoned in, I think, but mm. you're almost turned your brain into just, it's like an autopilot, right? So for me, I, I repeat things over and over in my head. And so that's the time to start practicing the things that you're going to need in the race, mantras and things like that. So like I, I would spend time focusing on like positive reinforcement thoughts. And so it's almost like a record that plays over and over and over in your mind. And so I will have these things that I'll say to myself and, you know, maybe it's I'm ready, I, I'm strong, whatever it is. And you'd say this over and over again. And if you do that in practice, that can be the zone in you know, that you need instead of the zone out. And it just gets you in almost like a uh, hypnotic state, you know, where you can just continue to, you know, work on your breathing. Things are, you know, things are feeling all like the rhythm feels good. And so doing that instead of being like, just out of it and thinking about Netflix and, you know, stuff like that, I think is good. Now, zoning out, can be very good too when you're maybe on a treadmill you want to listen to some music or podcast that's one thing but in no, like hard training long runs and you know when you're out on the road i think be zoned in don't be zoned out and it, it helps to be able to create the things that you're going to need mentally for for race day yeah because really long runs are your practice they are going to be preparing you for that distance, you know, whatever it is. And so the more you can rehearse that, like you said, not just the physical aspect of it, but the mental aspect and put those pieces together be so helpful. Especially for the marathon, you know, the marathon's super important. You're like, you're never going to go that far in training, probably like no one's probably going to go even I don't go that far. You know, I, I like nowadays 20 to 22 is a normal run for me. I used to go up to 26. And I have athletes that'll go to 26. But like, there's a cost there, you know, and but you still don't do it at the race pace. And so for most people, 20 is definitely the max that most people will do for. A, and, and so, but everything that matters in the marathon is the last 10 K. So just getting there, you know, is important. And so practicing that is, is you need that on race day. I mean, the doubts just flood in all the time. Like it doesn't matter what, even in a 5k, you start out and it's, I mean, you're, you'll, you're going to be bombarded by death the whole time. And so being able yeah. to bat those away and work through those that happens in practice. And so it happens like on a repetitive method, you know, over and over and over again. You've raced a really huge variety of distances. Do you have a favorite um, either currently or maybe in the past? What was your favorite distance to race? I had most of my international success, I think, a lot of it in the 10K, but I hated the 10K on the track. I, it was the worst. It was 25 laps and it's over. I made, you know, three world championships and two Olympic teams in that event, and I hated it. Um, I liked the 5K a lot. It was, you know, for me, you know, 13 minutes. I can, I could deal with it, you know, like it was, but man, the 10K just was the worst. And the marathon has just been such a cruel event, you know, too, that, um, I like the half marathon. I always run pretty good at the half marathon. So. And your, your half marathon PR is 60 minutes flat. Is that correct? Zero, zero. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I had a picture that showed 59, 59, but. That's how long it takes me to get out of the starting corral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> These big marathons. Okay. Here's a good one. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Especially because, Dathan, you've been at an elite level for so long. And you actually referred to yourself as an old guy a minute ago. I don't think you're an old guy, but no, <laughs> we're what, both older than you. So. <laughs> <laughs> what has been your number one training tip that has kept you healthy and able to run for so long? Well, staying healthy and able to being able to run for long is not the same thing. I've had a lot of injuries, and so um, being able to run for a long time, I think, has been more about passion, you know, and um, you know running is that metaphor, right? That, you know, you get out what you put in and all that stuff. It's true though, because you, you become passionate about something 
and it doesn't mean you have to make money. I was, I'm fortunate I made money doing it. Right. But like loving, you know, fitness and Pat, you know, having a passion for running is, is something that's paramount. And so having an appropriate time where you can step back and take a break and get your next goal is important. I think always having a goal. And as soon as the goal is gone, whatever it is, maybe it's just getting in shape. Maybe it's, um, you know, finishing your first marathon, whatever it is, like you have to have a goal. Like no one goes out to just do it just to do it. And even if your goal is just, I want to run every day because I want to feel healthy or it helps me mentally, like you have to maintain that goal. And it's never, it's not always going to be easy because there's a lot of times when you get out and you don't want to run, you're just, you're tired. I mean, life happens, you have kids like, you know, and I, I mean, you can easily miss those things, those those moments, and then you always look back and you just wish that you had done it. Usually, like, I mean, how many times have you sit at home after a long day's work, you know, and you and you don't run, and then you're sitting there and you're like, well, I'm not going to run now, but I really wish that I had. Versus those days that you went out and you're like, I do not want to do this. You come back and you're like, oh man, I feel good. Like it helps me. And yeah. so I think you know having consistency and goals is important. And so now staying healthy is it's harder you know it's um, it's part of part of part of running the red line sometimes and so like things mm-hmm. like marathons uh, they take a certain amount of risk on the body too and so having a coach that you know that's important that you trust for sure because if you don't have that um, then you're always going to second guess things and I think also just being able to really evaluate when something hurts and when something actually hurts because running hurts man like sometimes like you know like if you have both calves are sore that's fine that's okay like but if you're like wow my achilles is sore and it's starting to get swollen and it's getting worse each day like being honest with yourself saying okay i think it's telling me to take it easy then that's a that's a you know that's a sign and so you have to be honest with yourself and so having goals being Mm -hmm. honest with yourself i think those are those are really important I've heard Ryan Hall um, describe being a professional runner is actually being professional pain manager. Yeah, you're, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like being tortured, right? You know, like, (laughs) except for you could easily end it anytime you want. And so that's the hard part is when you're in a race and you're running and you're like, all I have to do is stop. (laughs) And it's a matter of how long can you take the pain that you're inflicting upon yourself. And I think, Ryan's right on there, you know, like at a certain point, you're the master of your own destiny here. And so, uh, but that's what their satisfaction comes from. I think so many people feel that when they, when they, it doesn't matter what level you are. Like if you've pushed yourself past in a, a point where you thought you could, then, you know, like the body, the mind usually gives out before the body, especially in race yeah. day, maybe, maybe not in training, but in race day, usually it gives out before the body. Hmm. And that, you know, to overcome that, those moments, I think that's what makes running special. That's what makes racing special. Good stuff. So you mentioned earlier that nutritionally, if you could go back and tell your younger self, you know, give your younger self some advice that you would probably change your, your strategy. Are there any other things that if you could like coach your younger self right now that you would do in terms of maybe injury prevention or, or you know, just ancillary things, recovery things? Yeah, I, I I wish I could go back and rewrite about ten years, <laughs> but uh, I don't look back like that now. I mean, I can only look forward, and so I try to make sure I don't make those same mistakes. I guess with people that um, that I may be in a position to help, and so. But if man, if I could go back, nutrition's a huge one. I mean, it, I I think that I probably underfueled or fueled in the wrong ways for so long that and sometimes you just don't even realize it. you're just training so hard and you eat what's around and maybe you're uh, maybe you're a college student and you know good ex- you know good food's expensive whatever it is but eventually that that catches up and and I was pretty good I mean I was a reckless trainer from you know from a young age like I could do anything until about 20 years old and mm. there's a period of time I think if you're a young runner so if there's any young runners out there you can almost always do more when you're in those teen years because it's like you're on steroids. You're like, your hormones are just 
like they let you recover at a rate that, hormone is going crazy. Yeah. And it, it lets you recover. Like, you know, like I used to work out five to six days a week when I was in high school. And I mean, the quality workouts, like every day was fast. We didn't do easy running. And so now, you know, I, not to say I couldn't do that, but I, they, like something has to give eventually. I was running a hundred miles a week, working out six days, a, you know, six days a week, never running easy, eating bad, you know, like, and I was able to do that. And then all of a sudden I would get in an injury cycle mm -hmm. and I could do amazing training still, but you know, I never was putting together the pieces, the, the strength work, um, the PT work, things like that. And so I had a, this big engine that could pump all the, you know, all the blood and get me going. Uh, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't structurally, you know, keep up. And so, and then I would be so stubborn because I was young that I would get back in front of make up for lost time again, you know? And so I made a lot of, you know, like it was just cyclical for 10 years and, and then I just, you know, like it, it was a, I had my best years where I would take about three or four months and just really, like, I was like a animal in a cage, you know, like, and then I didn't jump back, you know, and then I had a really good year or two. And so I wish that I could go and, and just maybe pump the brakes a little bit. And so there was some good things. I learned to work really hard. And that was one of the most important things I was, I learned to like, that I could do amazing things. I could always do more than I thought I could, but I think I needed some oversight too, you know, as an impressionable person and, and, you know, like someone to tell me, Hey, let's, let's look one, two years down the few, you know, down the road versus one to two races. Good stuff. So anyone just joining us right now on the live, we are here in the social distancing run Facebook group with Dathan Ritzenheim, three-time Olympian. And our audio dropped out once. So just to let folks know if this whole thing crashes, because it <laughs> does take a Once in 30 minutes isn't bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll just have to have Dathan just take over and just run with it then. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, if it crashes, we'll have we'll we'll restart it right here in the group. Uh, and big thanks to you can uh, a co-presenter of the social distancing run and you can sponsors uh Dathan and a lot of great athletes and we've been using you can for years too with our running um Angie you've done like over 50 marathons with their stuff um so here's a kind of a question about fueling it's it's also about breakfast it's about recovery this comes from Debbie actually a longtime academy member everyone see that could you walk us through your nutrition regimen on marathon day now I know yours is going to be as an elite, when you're running on the elite level, it's going to look different than, you know, <laughs> folks in our group, but maybe just general tips, uh, breakfast, race, fueling, timing, recovery. So, so race day, um, uh, <clears throat> it probably doesn't look super different, but like never do something first time on race day. That's rule number yeah. one, no matter what, don't eat stuff that you've never tried. And so I always think in those, you know, you have those big long runs and big workouts, try it that day, just like you would make sure it works good. And then I would say, make sure it's easily available because if you are traveling, say you're living in California and you go to run the Chicago marathon, make sure it's something that you can find. And so like for me, I found uh, rice to be set really well um, as a, as a last thing um, like the night before. And I always knew that I could go to Panda Express and get white rice, you know, and I'd set it in the, the refrigerator the night before, you know, yep. things like that. Um, so race day usually looks a lot different than um, training. Training, you want it, you know, there's a lot of um, grain, like really good grains and things like that, whole grains, um, you know, proteins, fruits, vegetables. You don't want to do that on race morning because, well, it's good for general health. From a GI standpoint, if you're pounding down, you know, fruit or vegetables in the morning, um, you might have problems. And so yeah. usually I like to go, but I also like to, to not completely change everything because um, I've, I, it's weird. I found, you know, even, you know, like carb, carb loading and stuff like that. I found to, it just kind of messes me up a little bit to go completely 
away from everything. And so, um, so I like to basically just make my, my carbohydrates a little bit more plain in the last day, even the last half day, really like, you know, like the, your, your lunch meal and stuff like, but the night meal, that's when it's okay to probably like, you don't probably need any vegetables like that, you know, like that last thing, meal in the morning. Um, make sure you have, well, I mean, a lot of people like you can in the morning and you, if you have that with something like oatmeal or a uh, bagel, you know, things like that, that's usually like a, your last topper offer, you know, like, cause at night, so you've been eating over those couple days, you've been topping off your glycogen stores over the course of a couple days. And then that morning, all you're doing is restoring the, your glycogen, which is, you know, the carbohydrates that your body's storing, that's not in your blood. You can have that in your muscles and in your liver. And overnight when you're sleeping, you're, you're using those to keep body functions going. So that's all you're doing. It doesn't take a whole lot. And so, but you don't want to have a full stomach on race day because you do have to take in things on, out on the course. Like if you're going to be out there for three or four hours, you got to take in things. And one of the mistakes that I found in my, my first ones is I, I just, I was so full in the last day and that morning that I didn't want to have anything. And then I ran out of fuel, you know, like anyway. And so I found that in the last couple of days, don't have big meals, have a lot of smaller meals, food throughout, and you will spread that out. And drinking some of those carbohydrates helps as well because you're getting hydration and your mm. stomach is not going to be so full of, like it's not three plates of pasta, like that's just not going to sit well. And so if your training level is less and you eat a little bit more, the fuel store should be topped off. And if you've kept in like 60, 70% of your normal, you know, diet and then added some complex carbohydrates in those last day or two, you should be fine. I mean, a lot of people overthink the, the whole, carb loading thing. And usually they just eat a high fat diet at the end of the, if they're, if they're just stuffing down fettuccine Alfredo, that's not going anywhere, but not anywhere close that it helps you on race day anyway. Yeah. That's yeah, that's a good point. And I think I find that eating an earlier dinner the night before a marathon is helpful. So like you said, you don't feel you, you know, you don't feel real full um, marathon morning, and you have a chance to, you know, have a good bowel movement, clear your system yep. out, and then you're ready to take in the fuels that you're going to use during the race. Absolutely. You got to get up like three to four hours beforehand and you got to get the coffee and you know, you got to have the systems got to be ready to go. Um, yep. And so but you know, you like you said, like there's some races. Chicago Marathon starts at like seven or seven thirty in the morning, and so you might have to get up at three a.m. You know, and so if you ate dinner at eight o'clock at night, you you're you're still digesting that food probably, and so mm. eating at five o'clock is a good idea that day. And I I think even having a bigger lunch is not a bad idea. Having a reasonable dinner, like it just that makes sense. Yeah. What do you do for a recovery meal afterwards? Oh, after a marathon, it's it's game game on whatever you want. Basically, that's 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 the reward time. And usually, it's never carbs. Like I never want carbs. I want like salty, like a burger, you know, yeah. salty proteins and stuff like that. Afterwards, I don't want to see a carb again, you know, for like days. <laughs> <laughs> what do you take during a race? I mean, what does your fueling regimen look like usually? So during the race, you know, the elites are kind of lucky. You know, we get to have your own personal fluid stations. So like whatever race, if you run a marathon, then you're base like any race that's not a marathon, I don't even take anything. It could be even if it was a hot day and a half marathon, I wouldn't take probably anything. I might throw some water on my head, but that's it. Um, other that's than it. that's you don't it. drink the water. I might put it in my mouth, but you're not drinking it down really. Yeah. This is an hour half marathoner. So you yeah, know like yeah. he's there and he's done. <laughs> The thing is, it's hard. Like, there's a huge difference between. So, for me, my marathon pace, if it's around five minute miles down to like 440 or so miles for half marathon, like that 20 seconds is a huge difference in how fast I'm breathing. Like, mm. I can talk a little bit at a marathon pace so I can drink, but I can barely, it's like you choke on the yeah. drinking, you know. So, even if it was hot, it would, it would throw me off. And so, yeah. gotcha. um, and so, but like, so then in the race, we get our own fluids in the marathon. 
So every 5K usually you get to have a um, whatever you want. And so, but it's different for athletes probably at my level uh, because if you're running for just over two hours, metabolically you're you're burning you need stuff fast still and so like you can is very good for someone who's going to be out there for three four hours because it's still it, it's a slow process because you're you're still running at an intensity level that's a little bit lower now it, it's still hard it's just as hard for them you know like structurally but but like metabolically it's a little different so for me i take in something that's you know like a, a quicker carbohydrate still and most athletes do at that, you know, on, on the elite level. So I'll utilize you can in the training part and stuff. And it's great for people who are, you know, going to be out there for really long, great for ultra stuff, great for triathlon. You're out there a long time. But uh, yeah, for me, like in my bottles, usually it's, it's something that's hit me quick. So changing subjects a little bit, did you have any races that got canceled this year? I didn't have anything on the calendar because I, the Olympic trials was, February 29th. And I didn't have anything on the calendar after that. It was like, that was the only thing. So it, and this all happened, all the COVID stuff happened right after that. So, yes. I mean, it yeah. was almost immediately, you know, like within a couple of weeks, Olympic was, trials and then LA marathon kind of squeaked in and then everything yep. was down. Yep. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of whoever ran Tokyo and LA, they're going to be the top, uh, you know, top guys in the marathon for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, the Olympic trials this year, I think I read that you, you didn't finish or had a, had an injury or can you go yeah. into that a little bit? Yeah. So I, I ended up, uh, having, oh, probably about, it was right around Christmas time injury to my hip and really the truth, it was such a long shot. It's going to make the line, the start line. So, but I'm just one of those guys that I was like. I'm not, there's a way I'm going to try to find a way, you know? Yeah. And so I ended up, uh, I didn't do really anything for about a week. Then I just, I biked really hard for about three, uh, two weeks. And then I have this alter G treadmill, which is, uh, like a, it, it takes some body weight off. You zip into this bubble, it blows her in, creates pressure and lifts you up. So you can run it. Like I started running at like 70% of my body weight and I just started training like crazy a hundred miles a week on it. I had an altitude mask going and I had all these layers on so that my heart rate would be really high. And I just was just training like a crazy person thinking there's no way that I'll make the, the line still. I mean, I only had about seven weeks or something like that. And like about 10 days before, even less, maybe seven days before I talked to Kevin Hansen, my coach. And I was like, you know, I just, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. And it was kind of like, I just needed him to, to have that conversation with me. And, you know, I, I, he's like, I'll support whatever you want to do, you know? And, uh, and then I sat around the next hour or two and I was just like, yeah, to hell with it. I was like, I sent him a text. I was like, let's do it. And I was like, <laughs> I hadn't ran outside yet. And it was seven days, but I had been running hundred miles a week at like, you know, 85% body weight. And I remember doing a workout. I didn't want to do too much because I didn't want to like going from 85% to a hundred uh, mechanically it's pretty good, but it's still that eccentric loading, just like running downhill. You're basically putting on a backpack for me that weighs 20 something pounds. And so it makes your quads really sore. So I did just enough. I did three times a mile at race pace, like five days out. And I was like, okay, you know, I had done, I didn't, I just warmed up on the alter G. I didn't do hardly anything. And I was like, I feel great though. Like I had trained so hard and then so I, my longest run was six miles. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So I, so even I, I, Dathan, even I trained better than that, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was, uh, you know, to tell you the truth, I was actually amazed. Like I made it 15 miles with the lead pack, um, that five minute mile pace. And, uh, by nine miles, my quads were blown up though. I was felt, you know, like, so I, I, I made it to 15. Then I started falling off. And then by 20 or so, it felt like my femurs were kind of ramming into the, my midsection. There's no quads left. And then, I, yeah, the, so these last hills came. And I, I, wouldn't, I don't even know if I could have made the, the finish line. So I got done. I spent four days in bed. I couldn't even move. <laughs> oh, man. So, so I, was, I was amazed uh, to have made it what I was. And so, yeah, it was, it was rough. But <laughs> man. you nothing ventured, nothing gained, I guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm one of those people, I'm an internal optimist. And mm -hmm. I was like, 
you know what? I might pull off a miracle. Like that's what I felt like. And actually to tell you the truth for the first nine miles of the race, I thought I was like, you know what? I'm going to pull off the miracle today. It's going to be that Cinderella man moment, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's a Rocky type thing, you know, like my son was every day he's watching Rocky, making me watch Rocky Aww. and stuff, you know, like, and so I was like, I got to do this. I got to do it for them. I want them to see the hard work that was put in. And, and at the end of the day, I was like, my, my body couldn't do anymore. I was like, I did everything I could. And so I was proud of that still. Yes. Um, but, uh, hmm. but yeah, like I thought for nine miles, I was like, it's going to happen. And then I was like, we'll see. And then at the end, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be alive. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what goes through your mind when you, you know, I mean, as you, you know, decide to DNF a race, I mean, yeah. Cause I know I'm sure it's a process and you're, you know, trying to prioritize different factors. Like you need to live to run another day. And you know, there's a lot of things that are going through your mind. How, you know, kind of walk us through that a little bit. So, yeah, I guess I have only DNF. There's very few races that I've had DNF on the Olymp my first Olympics. I had a stress reaction in my foot. And to tell you the truth, I could have kept running, I think. And that one I was, that's the one that I was like, man, it still haunts me a little bit. I know that I wasn't running well, but I stepped off the track with 2K to go. And I remember watching them finish and thinking, man, I have a long ways to go. I was 21 and these guys just amazing, you know? And that helped me though, actually. Yeah. The next time I dropped out of a race, I think was uh, the New York City Marathon in 2016. Um, I was very fit. I ran 60-12 for half marathon beforehand. Uh, but my plan, I had plan of, problem really bad plantar fasciitis going in and it was a struggle to make it the last like week but I was in very good shape and so uh, but I unfortunately I tore my planner at about 19 miles into that race and I, there was just no going forward like I mean yeah. there was nothing I could do with that one I mean I was you know like I was on crutches after that one so right. um, and then I dropped out of the Olympics well actually I guess I dropped out of the trials the Olympic trials in 2016 and um my thought process there, I dropped out at 20 and I was having really bad cramping problems. And I said, I was thinking, I'm going to come back. If I drop, if I stop now, I won't do the damage. I'll come back to make the track team. And it had been years since I'd ran on the track at that point, but that was what went into that thought process. And then this last one, yeah, same thing. I was like, I couldn't make another step. <laughs> and so sometimes, you know, the body, you know, I, the body will, will give out sometimes and, but a lot of time it's the mind and, so I've had a couple of both. I think I've had four or five DNFs and um, it's been split 50, 50 on whether or not it's like if you're talked yourself into a reason why I can stop or if the body, if you have an injury, sometimes it just does it to you. Well, if you race enough and long enough, you're going to have those disappointing races where, you know, you feel like you were ready, but something went wrong or your body just wasn't cooperating. What, what's the process that you um, kind of, you know, go through and deal with that disappointment after a race, kind of like break it down so that, you know, you can learn from it, I guess. Learn from every race. And so the good and the bad, and I like to evaluate, but not in the day of, like, usually it's emotional. Like if something's gone wrong, you, the first day is not going to, it's not good to make no decisions based on that. And so yeah. pull yourself, you know, give yourself that day, and, you know, like if I got hurt or something like that, my wife would always tell me, give yourself one day, you know, like, and it helps cool the mind. And like, as a coach, I think that too, I don't like whatever I say to someone, like if they hit, ran bad, it's not going to matter at that point, you know, like, so there's a, you can, you console them, you know, like let them know you're there. And so I always, that was good for me too, when coaches would do that. And then the next days you can start logically talking through, okay, what went wrong? Was I mentally not in it? Was there a physical problem? Did I go out too fast? Is there an injury? And then if there is, it's easy to think on a level head at that point. But the day of is always never, never make that decision. You know, it's always yeah. going to be, it's, it's, you're, you're not going to come to the right conclusion. Usually it's like that grieving process that you have to go it through. Is. First. <laughs> yep. I was going to ask you a similar question, but more about dealing with injury mentally, because I know we have a lot of runners, uh, tuning in who have dealt with injuries, especially as they get older, uh, like 80% of runners or something are going to experience an injury at some point. Yeah. Injuries are part of the game. Yeah. Um, and you're right. It, it's, um, it can be cyclical, 
you know, too. It's very hard sometimes when you get in the cycle of injury to break out of it. Uh, and so um, usually there, see, there's little injuries and big injuries, but no matter what, it's always, it's almost always a training load problem, you know, or, and so the training load is, you know, your recovery and, you know, all that goes in, right? Like how much you can train versus how much you can recover. So it's only really catastrophic. Like if you sprain your ankle, that's a freak thing, you know, but you know, if, if, if you have a stress fracture, you were either training too much or you're racing too little or you're doing too much intensity. And so being able to identify that's important because going forward, you have to be able to say, uh, make sure, do I feel like I, I figured it out? And I've had a lot of times where I thought I figured it out and I did not because I continued to go through the same problem. <laughs> and so having people that you trust to advise you on that is important. So I have a PT and a chiropractor, a doctor, a uh, coach, and these people help me decide because you're, the problem is with your own running is you're just too emotionally invested, you know, like, and so like, from a, like a coaching standpoint, you could, pro a lot of people might know basically, you know, I could, I should probably do this or that, right. And they might not be a scientist or they might not be very, um, uh, very experienced with it, but you kind of know, but the odds are you're not going to do it. You know, like you're like, you'll convince yourself that I can do two more miles because you get in the, you get the high when you're out there running, you know, and you're supposed to go 16 today for your last long run, you know, before the marathon. And you're like, I want to see how, how, what it feels like Pat, to 18. And you know, all of a sudden <laughs> it's, it's like human nature, you know, like, and so running is a, uh, that's that runner's high, you know, you get addicted to it and all of a sudden you make bad judgment calls. And so that's why having those support people is important. They help you avoid those problems, hopefully, and then identify if, even if they do come along. So it's uh, someone, have someone you can rely on. That's, I think that's a great point because often what we would advise other people to do in the same situation that we're in is different than what we do to ourselves. You know, we often don't prioritize, like you said, recovery yeah. and, you know, we know we should strength train, but you know, you'd rather go out and run or, yeah. you know, we know we should get in the right amount of sleep or dealing with our nutrition. But, you know, in the moment, it's really hard to focus on that unless you have it reinforced, like you said, through a coach or, you know, somebody you trust, someone you have in your corner to, um, you know, kind of be that angel on your shoulder. <laughs> You're absolutely, you got to have the little, the little person talking here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question here for you, Dathan, from our friend Eric. Many elite marathoners have had success running ultras. Have you ever considered coming over to the dark side? <laughs> I would not be a good ultra runner. I am. It's not in my, my psyche. I, I hate, I don't even like running over seven minute pace. Like I can't on my easy days. Like I'm, mm. I'm a, uh, I don't want to call it. It's like, I get like the, the high from going from intensity. Like, and so like, it sounds, I, I have the utmost respect for anybody who's an ultra runner because I couldn't do it. You know, like I just, I, it's not for me. <laughs> it's just not for me. No way. <laughs> well, hey, if you're running uphill on a trail, you're going to feel that intensity no matter what pace you're at. But you know what? I, you know, everybody has certain talents, you know, like, yeah. and, and this is like when I was in college, um, I had two roommates, teammates, uh, Jorge and Eduardo Torres. One was a, uh, you know, national champion and Olympian. And the other one made world cross country teams we were like the hot, like we were, we were formula one racers, man. We were, I, you know, I could, you put us on the track and spikes and we're amazing. We did, uh, we ran Mount Albert, um, you know, and it was, I mean, 14,000, whatever feet. And, uh, we had a, a roommate of ours who was a walk on and he had tree, tree trunk, like quads, you know, like he did not look like us tiny little guys and he beat <laughs> us up to the, like, it was, it, it was a different talent, you know, yeah. like, and, you think, oh, this guy is just an aerobic monster can do anything. I, I mean, it's it's crazy. Like, there's some people that are just good. Like, I look at a person like uh, Michael Wardian or something. I mean, yeah. I couldn't do that. Like, I mean, it's amazing, you know, like what he can do. Like, every day he can run <laughs> marathons and, and be okay. You know, like, durability would never work for me and like that. And and it's a, it's, it's a talent level. And 
So I, I got to, I stick to the, you know, like if I could keep running on the track, I probably would at this point, but like uh, that, those days are, are done too, but I would go that way versus going the up a distance. <laughs> I remember, um, we got to hear Shalane Flanagan do a little talk one time before a race at some expo. And she was talking about how she tried to go trail running and then she injured herself <laughs> and her dad was giving her some advice. He said, you don't take a Ferrari off roading. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. My college coach, Mark Wetmore always, he used to use this analogy about, um, uh, dirty Harry, you know, like there's all these, like eight, there's 10 guys, you know, they're all shooting at him and he's killing them all off one after another. And then there's one guy at the end, you know, and they, dirty Harry comes out and he's walking up towards him. And the guy's standing there with his gun and he's just shaking and he just goes for it to shoot him. And Harry, dirty Harry kills him. And he walks over and he says, uh, looks over and he says, man's got to know his limitations, you know? And, and so uh, at the end of the day, like you got to know your limitations. And uh, I look at the mountains and those ultras and I'm like, I'm, I'm okay with the, uh, I'm okay with my lane here. <laughs> well, um, Thank you everyone for watching the live stream and anyone that's watching it after this ended. You guys are awesome. Just so much positive energy coming from this group. I think we're up over like 5,000 people in the group now and or six. I haven't checked the numbers. Um, and I know a lot of you are, uh, maybe it's hard to relate to the the marathon talk. Um, we, uh, we have a podcast about marathon training, but we realized that uh, maybe some of you are still training for your first 10K or first 5K and it wasn't that long ago. I remember I was training for my first 5K and, and running three miles felt like uh, almost impossible. It's not me. easy. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Journey of a mil uh, thousand miles begins with a single step, right? So yep. That's right. You got to it start. You got to start somewhere. Exactly. So virtual high five to all of you out there. Um, just getting that's started right. <laughs> from Dathan Ritz and I virtual high five to you guys. That's awesome. And uh, we were talking before we we kicked off the live stream about you doing the social distancing run, I guess for a 5k distance for that. Well, 5k tank. What, well, I got my pick, don't I? Yeah. yeah whatever yeah. you want. 5, 5, what, what, and up. 5k and up all the way to marathon. That's right. It's not hey, going to be, have... a, it won't be a marathon, but I'll do something. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> we know it won't be a trail run, right? <laughs> Rail trail. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> Love it. Cool. Well, before we let you go, if people wanted to learn more about you and, and what you're up to, where, where can we send them on the internet? You can uh, check me out on Instagram or Twitter. Both my handle is DJ Ritzenhein, R-I-T-Z-E-N-H-E-I-N. -E um, both of them the same. It's not DJ. Those are my initials, but people send me okay. their music too. So <laughs> you can check me out either one of those places. You can you can uh, send me an email on, uh, I have a link on my uh, coaching website there. You can send me an email on that as well. Right on. And thanks again to you can for making this possible and uh, being a, a great fueling source that, like I said, we've used it at so many marathons and, and Dathan has used it since 2012. And um, if you want to, if you guys want to find out more, just go to generation, you forward slash MTA, I think is the, is the link, but, generationucan.com definitely in the coupon code i think you can save 35 percent on you can hydrate which is their electrolyte source which is massive uh if you use the code mta hydrate and then if you're a first-time customer if you want to buy their bars like they've got a new flavor of bars have you tried the peanut butter two new flavors Two the, new bar, the bars are the best, man. I could, <laughs> I could live. I, that's all I need, probably. That Same with coffee. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So use the code MTA25, I believe it is. If you are a first-time customer, you'll get 25% off. MTA15 for uh, returning customers to get 15% off everything else over there. Anything else I need to say, Angie? I don't think so. We really appreciate you taking the time with us this afternoon. It's been great talking yeah. with you and hope right. you got you and your family stay safe and sane. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Absolutely. You guys too. All right. See you guys later. All Thanks right. So see much. Ya. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.